Well, thank you all for um, for being here and for uh, inviting me and for uh, uh, indulging in this uh, in this presentation tonight. Um, I, you know, I, I have to be out of here by about 8:15, so I think the best way to do this 8:15, 8:20, or I will be in trouble. So, um, um, so I think the best way to do this is. Um, I, I would much prefer that this be interactive as opposed to me sitting here talking. Um, so if you have questions, um, I, I, I'm an instructor at UIS also, and so I, I, like I say to the people there, please just let me know, just raise your hand and, and just let me know so that, uh, so that I don't have four people talking to me at once. That would be, that would be really, really helpful. Um, you know, and, and I think where I want to start this is by saying, um, before I tell you a little bit about myself, I, I truly have a lot of respect for the work that you do, for why you're here, and for the reasons that you are um, involved with the uh, organizations and the, uh, the purposes that, that you are. And the, reason, the reasons are many, but in regard to what I have done in my career, it's actually very, very similar. Um, that what, what I have done as a defense attorney in my career, primarily, uh, is advocate against the death penalty, the, uh, the um, uh, actions of government in taking the human life of another, another human being, uh, the ultimate exercise in governmental power. My goodness, people don't trust the government to do much of anything these days, but we're going to trust them to take, make proper decisions on, as if there is one, on what lives to take? It's preposterous. So um, much of my career uh, since 1985, as a matter of fact, has been uh, in the area of the death penalty. But I really respect what you do because here's, here's what, I've, what I've found. And that is that much of, much of policy, much of policy that guides what I have done in the, the area in which I have worked is driven by much of what you all have probably encountered and that's fear, right? They're afraid, aren't they? They're afraid. And it's not the responses to what you do are not rational very often. The responses in the area where I have worked, well, if that guy didn't do this crime, he probably did something else, is equally irrational and is equally based on fear. And so that's something I really want to touch upon as we talk tonight and kind of just open you know, open some eyes and just share some ideas on, on the topic of fear and how that drives so much of, uh, of what I have done and, and what you are encountering. And again, kudos to you for, uh, for what you're doing. Uh, stay the course. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's so valuable to what we are supposed to stand for in this country. Um, <clears throat> I told you a little bit about my, about my career. I got a, out of law school in 1983, and I knew I wanted to do something important, but I didn't know what. I had no idea. Um, my, uh, my uh, then wife was uh, pregnant, so I did know one thing, and that was I better get a job yep. of some kind. So, um, so I got a job. I'd never been to Springfield, Illinois, and I heard about a job with the Appellate Defender Office. The Appellate Defender, of course, is an agency of uh, state government that um, represents most of the people who are filing criminal appeals in this state. Uh, I started working for them in late 1983 and have been with or was with them the majority of my uh, of my legal career doing uh, first non-death penalty work but then very quickly i was i felt really called in to do the death penalty work um i worked on a case uh, as a naive young lawyer i was handed a case in 1985 uh, when my boss came to me with this four huge boxes of stuff and he said this is my boss remember okay and he came to me and he said you want to work on a death penalty case? And I thought there was probably only one answer, which was yes, but I really wanted to work on a death penalty case. And um, I worked my way through those 11,000 pages. And um, about 10 years later, Rolando Cruz, who you may have heard of, um, was exonerated after we won his case twice on appeal. Um, and uh, after he uh, won an acquittal up in DuPage County um, from a very, very brave judge who really bucked the system to say this case is garbage and we're, uh, it's not going to go on any longer. So um, once, I work, you, once you work on a case of that magnitude in nature, you're hooked. You know, it's a death penalty and it's innocence all in one. Uh, and, and I was hooked and I was called to do this, uh, this kind of work 
for my career. Um, I was in private practice for, uh, for three years, just a few blocks from here, uh, almost exclusively representing injured people, people who were injured either on the job uh, or who were um, uh, in accidents uh, of other kinds. So a lot of insurance companies on the other side and uh, employers, quite frankly, on the other side. Um, and that was very valuable to, to do that, but my calling is in the area of criminal law, the death penalty, and innocence. Um, and the power of government, obviously. Um, I work now uh, at the university. I teach a class in, uh, in wrongful convictions, um, actual innocence. Uh, and uh, um, more, more of my time, though, is actually spent as the legal director of the uh, Downstate Illinois Innocence Project, uh, which is housed at the university. Um, and I, my, more specifically, my job is to work on cases where DNA can make a difference, cases where DNA testing can be done and um, you know, ideally show that uh, the person who is incarcerated is not, doesn't belong there, that they were wrongfully convicted. It's a fascinating job. I wouldn't trade it for anything um, be, for many reasons, one of which is we're actually starting to make some inroads with uh, law enforcement with some, some jurisdictions. So, <laughs> um, where some prosecutors, and I've even got two cases where it's, there's police officers who are pushing for the DNA testing to be done for somebody who's in prison because they think he's there wrongfully. That is, I think, that is, um, yeah, it really is. It's, it's, it's very important. It's progress, and I'm very, very excited about that. On the other hand, there are counties where um, prosecutors would no sooner you know, agree to do DNA testing on a case than, than they would jump off a bridge, which I have suggested to them. Um, but um, so progress is slow in this area, but I'm really excited um, about, uh, about doing this. And I have a lot of respect for those prosecutors and those police officers who, you know, imagine this, take the attitude of let's do the test and find out. Imagine that. You take that justice-based attitude, and that's all we're looking for in these cases. I'm not interested in, um, and we at the project are not interested in, um, you know, freeing people who are guilty. That's not our mission. That's not what we're funded for. That's not in what I'm interested in doing. And we're going to talk about some of the history and some of the numbers, uh, the historical basis for, for the belief that there are a lot of wrongfully convicted people in prison in our state and elsewhere in this country and obviously in the world. Um, you know, at this point, I think I want to ask you uh, just a couple of other, or just a couple of questions, just to kind of get a get a, uh, a basis uh, of uh, of knowledge and just of some talking points um, talking points for us to do. Um, just real quickly, name some of the um, just a little discussion here. Name some of the people in history or groups in history who were wrongfully convicted and incarcerated. Mumia Abu Jamal. Mumia, Mumia okay, Mumia. sure. Mumia, absolutely, in Pennsylvania. Okay, very good. Who else? Are we using the hand signals? Sure, go ahead. Yeah, great, very good. Fort Heights 4 in a uh, South Chicago uh, case. Orlando Cruz. Yes, correct, very true. And his co defendant, uh, Alejandro Hernandez. Who else? And I'm talking historically. What? Any other names come to mind? Salem witches. Salem witches. You know, be before we were even a, a country, we were this country was <laughs> wrongfully uh, convicting and executing people. What else? People from the Blair Witch Project. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, Florida. you know, you're on the right track. I think. I, I forgot what it's called. The Salem witches is probably what you're yeah. thinking of. Yeah. No, I that's, said Blair Witch. Well, you're on the Sorry, like I, I said, you're on the right track. <laughs> Alfred Alfred uh, Dreyfus. Dreyfus Affair. How about Hurricane Carter? Yes, sir. Oh, Jimmy Simpson. Oh. Oh, that. Well, nine out of ten so far. <laughs> what about Leonard Palatier? Right. Okay, absolutely. And I don't know that much about the case in particular, but I'm with you. I, I, I understand. Um, uh, Joan of Arc. Um, Hurricane Carter. Um, and a lot of other folks. How about people through McCarthyism? 
Yeah, Scottsboro. How about, again, victims of McCarthyism? What's McCarthyism? Um, it's a whole other teaching. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's something that happened in the 19, early 1950s and, and a little bit beyond where people were, um, were uh, investigated and um, treated horribly in all respects uh, because of their beliefs. Nothing, not what they did, but what they believed in, in this country. Went to the oh right! To hear about exactly, it yeah. And right. Had their lives and ruined. and some people, yeah, exactly. So, uh, well, but not well, not guilty of any crime. What else? More well, broadly speaking, uh, the uh, if you, particularly if you think about Madeleine Albright's statement about she didn't care about the five hundred thousand people who were dying in, in Iraq because of the U.S. sanctions, uh, the entire war, convicting essentially the entire people of Iraq and sure. Afghanistan and other places where they're dropping bombs or sending drones in to, to kill people who have not even had the chance to be wrongfully convicted, sure. but who are suffering the death penalty. Well, a lot of wars from that perspective. <coughs> yeah. Yes. Close to home here, the Verdant Mine. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, oh, yeah. yeah. Right, right. right. Riots yeah. and trials. And we can come up with all kinds of, uh, unfortunately, all kinds of examples and uh, incidents in history where there have been uh, wrongful, and when I say wrongful, I'm talking about people who didn't commit a crime, who actually were actual innocents. That's what that's what we work on: is cases of actual innocence. If a person was involved in a crime, but they didn't have a fair process, uh, obviously that's wrong. But that's not what we do. We we are trying to limit our work to the the, uh, the actually innocent people, people who don't belong uh, in prison. You know, wrongful convictions really first came to the attention of this country um, in the last 25 years. Um, and there are three cases that I really just want to mention for your, uh, for your attention. Um, and the first one is actually out of this state, and it happened right over there uh, in, you know, the, the, the fallout from it at least happened right over here in the Capitol building, and that's the Gary Dotson case. Anybody remember Gary Dotson? Yes. Yeah, and that was a case where um, this man uh, was uh, in prison for years uh, for sexual assault, rape, and um, his uh, the the um, complaining the complainant the woman came forward and said he didn't do anything, and so of course there was a huge to do in the news about what the process should be to look at her recantation and and uh, how do we how do we resolve this, and at that time, a lot of us lawyers heard for the first time, the three little letters, DNA. Exactly, that's the first time that we, even in law, that we heard that. And it was uh, DNA, wow, I've heard, I remember that from Mr. Craig in high school science. Um, but other than that, how does it apply to law? And we learned that, oh, it, it can apply to law. So that case really was the first case, and actually I still remember seeing, um, seeing Phyllis George on national TV because I was really interested in the case. You know, that's what I was doing and, you know, and, uh, and seeing Phyllis George on TV asking Gary Dotson and Kathy Webb, who was the, the young lady, to hug on TV and thinking, oh my gosh, that's really inappropriate. That's just not, not a good move, uh, Phyllis. So, um, but this case got a, got a big national following because of DNA being used to resolve, um, be, being used to resolve the case. In Maryland, a few years later, there was a man sent to death row. His name is Kirk Bloodsworth. Kirk Bloodsworth was sent to death row for the uh, sexual assault and murder of a young woman. Five eyewitnesses identified Kirk Bloodsworth as the man running from the scene of the crime. Five eyewitnesses. One thing we've learned through, um, through experience is that one of the um, largest areas of, you know, just flat out bad, unreliable, um, you know, overblown evidence, but dangerous evidence is eyewitness identifications. And the problem is that very often the, the degree of certainty of the witness, you know, the five eyewitnesses say in Kirk Bloodsworth's case, the degree of their certainty has nothing to do with the reliability of their testimony. In other words, a witness comes in and says, I'm sure that's the guy who did it. Well, that has to do with their personality and not with their identification, the reliability of that identification. Um, but the problem with that, of course, is that jurors, when they see that witness having certainty, well, that, that person is going to get convicted.
Kirk Bleswick was convicted by, uh, by the testimony of five eyewitnesses. He later, fortunately, you know, thank goodness for DNA testing, otherwise he would, be, he would have been executed by the state of Maryland long, long ago. Um, DNA proved, guess what? Five eyewitnesses were wrong. Now, if you had asked me that before I knew about Kirk, uh, Kirk's case, and I've met Kirk, he's a wonderful guy. He spoke here at UIS uh, last year. I hope some of you had the opportunity to see that. Very moving presentation. Um, you know, and if, um, if somebody had told me prior to knowing that about that case that five people could be wrong, I would have said, boy, that's tough. You know, that, that's, that, that's, that's kind of stretching. And I think one or two could be wrong, maybe three, but when you get more than that, it's going to be pretty tough. But five were wrong. And so the power of DNA to correct even those convictions which sometimes seem rock solid is very, very important. And I'll tell you about another case, a third case, which really started the innocence movement. There's the Cruz case was very important, and I'm really proud of my work in that. But there's another case that really got the ball rolling in this state in terms of awareness of wrongful convictions, and that's the Anthony Porter case. Anthony Porter was a man who was on Illinois' death row. He was convicted in Cook County, uh, and you, know, it's, you can read, it, Google Anthony Porter if you want to read about the case. The way that the police work was done and the obvious suspect was ignored right from the get-go, and the whole focus went on this uh, mentally retarded African-American man from Cook County is really disgusting. So you can read you can read about that case. But the bottom line for Anthony was he was within three days of his execution. And I mean, I don't, not being sent to prison, of his actual execution by the state, okay? Three days. When his lawyer filed a motion to have him, to have his fitness evaluated. The law, you know, the law says a person cannot be executed unless they know what's happening to them. Isn't that nice? You know, isn't that just really pleasant? You know, we're not going to execute you if you don't know what's happening. But if you do, then we're ready to go. That's what the law is. So they, the petition was filed saying, look, look, Anthony is not, um, is not uh, in good, in a good, you know, mental uh, way right now, and we want his fitness to be evaluated. That stopped the clock, thank goodness, because when the clock stopped, then good people like Paul Cialino and the students in Chicago, uh, with the project up there. Um, got to work on his case and got uh, and um, got an admission and further evidence on the guy who really <laughs> committed the crime. Three days away from his execution, and it took, as I said, it took some people saying this is wrong. There's something wrong. People stepped up and did something, and they did something important. People could have sat back and said, uh, "Who cares?" But fortunately, they didn't, and that started the ball rolling. And now in this state. Uh, we all know that the death penalty has been, been uh, repealed. Uh, that's that's uh, despite the fact that it cost, it cost, I think it was 37 of my coworkers their jobs. They all said that's okay. You know, that's that's okay. Yes, ma'am. I just wondered if you had any inside information about about uh, Ryan and his decision to uh, to do that because it seems to me he had some epiphany. And, uh, and I'm curious about that. Yeah, that's, that's a very good question. And just to provide a tad bit of background on your question, um, after the Anthony Porter case and the Cruz and Hernandez case and some of the other cases started coming out and it seemed like there was a new case every week in the Tribune or the, you know, all the newspapers around the state. And the Tribune, by the way, I'm going to interject this. Um, the role that the media has played in, in my little corner of the world, the wrongful convictions and the death penalty was very important. Some very good people, and the investigative journalists and Eric Zorn and some other people, took up this just in the name of the truth and made a difference. So I'm very proud, of, proud to have uh, been associated with, uh, with those folks uh, as well. Um, so, um, okay, and I just lost my train of thought. Help me out. George Ryan. George Ryan, okay, thank you. So anyway, so after all these cases came to the fore, we started learning about, about the cases. Um, and George Ryan then was the uh, governor, obviously. And he did a couple of different things that were very, very important. And one thing he did, people say he cleaned out death row. No, he didn't clean out death row. He transformed the sentences of about 170 men and a few, a few women who were on death row into natural life sentences. Natural life in this state, by the way, means 
you don't ever come out. There is no parole for such for such a case. My um, my very um, clear and consistent understanding of what happened is that George Ryan did have um, a serious troubled conscience about his role in the execution of the last man who was executed by the state, who was Andrew Cocorales. Um And he was very troubled by the concept that, you know, his pen, you know, was either one of these or one of these. And his pen would, could make a difference in a man's life. And he truly was very troubled by that. And that, um, you know, I, I know a lot of the folks who were close to him as he, as he uh, lingered over that very horrible decision. And so I think you're right. I think it was a matter of conscience uh, with Governor Ryan, coupled with the fact that we got a real problem in this state, you know, as, and it was coming out, uh, it was coming to our, to our attention uh, at that time. So a very good question. Yes, sir. Yes, I say that um, another aspect of the cleaning out death row thing mm -hmm. was that that wasn't really a unique event in Illinois history. I think we've had like maybe four mass commutations due to different yeah I didn't know it was four but there have been prior no you're, you're right and um, certainly what year was it 1972 mm -hmm. um, yeah and that was of course thanks to Supreme Court decision in uh, in Furman versus Georgia but yeah it, you're right there were the others probably didn't clear out the whole thing but but right no, but just a procedural right. issue or something. right and since then notably on that on that same line since then, there have been other states that have taken similar steps in getting rid of getting rid of, the, of their death penalty. And you know, the whole death penalty thing, and it's I don't want to get too far into that because that's that's not what I do now because it's gone, thankfully. Um, but the whole death penalty thing is very related to the innocence and wrongful convictions concept. Um, you know, if people were being wrongfully convicted and sent to prison for five years, I don't think there'd be quite the attention to this and the concern about it It'd be bad but not as bad as executed by the government um, so it is very very related and Kirk Bloodsworth's case and Anthony Porter's case were both death penalty cases and they really got the ball the, the ball moving now um, just some really quick um, numbers for you um, there have been uh, nearly 300 DNA only DNA only you know, pure DNA cases, exonerations by the uh, the Innocence Project, and that's their term. Those are their words. The Innocence Project in New York at Cardozo Law School, nearly 300 exonerations. You know, that's that's a, a plane and a half full of people. That's a lot of people. That's just by that project. Okay, and they are the major DNA project in the country, obviously. But here's an interesting further number. I want to take a guess? What percentage of cases? What percentage of cases, of serious felony cases, involve um, a perpetrator leaving biological evidence at the scene of the crime? What percentage? 